That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Isha. So now we have uh, another a, a visiting medical student from University of Missouri, Missouri, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Matt. Matt's going to present about acute onset mesotrophy. So thanks, Matt. Thank you, Brent. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Matt Kleithermis. I'm a fourth-year medical student from the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Um, just a brief little bit about my presentation. It'll be acute, acute onset of mesotropia in children, and a lot of this will be just kind of an overview for medical students. Um, because I certainly learned a lot about this topic when I came here and started following Dr. Dries. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm from this school, obviously. Um, and I didn't include a slide of the picture of the School of Medicine at the University of Missouri in Kansas City because it's not particularly pretty. So I decided to uh, include this fountain instead because KC is known as the City of Fountains, second only in the world to Rome, um, in case you guys didn't know that. Fun fact, although most people know it as the City of Barbecue. So a little overview, I'm going to orient this, this presentation kind of um, differently from most. I'm going to go over the different diagnosis for multiple types of uh, esotropias. I'm going to cover the workup. I'm going to go over the clinical exam imaging studies and patient history that plays an important role. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a clinical case after we cover some of the basics so that you guys can work through the thought process of how to diagnose what's going on. Um, physicians, obviously, you already know how to do this. This is uh, mostly for the students. So. Um, afterwards, I'm going to talk about some of the treatment options um, for this, for one diagnosis in particular of a case that I was fortunate enough to see at Primary Children's Hospital. Um, then we can have discussion and questions following that. So types of ET. So there's several broad categories. Uh, most people try and divide isotropia into incompetent versus concomitant, where incompetent means that the size of the deviation um, varies depending on the gaze of the patient. And concomitant means that the size of the deviation is constant no matter where the patient is looking. Um, constant versus intermittent also are subcategories of concomitant, which are pretty much self-explanatory. Um, <coughs> more specific types of ET include congenital or infantile ET, which is present from birth or very shortly thereafter becomes apparent and will most, most often require surgery to be repaired. Accommodative ET is a little bit easier to fix because it's caused by um, most often hypertropia, where patients uh, have difficulty seeing far away, or I'm sorry, difficulty seeing up close, um, so that when they try and um, focus on things that are near them, the eyes want to converge and accommodate at the same time. So the more they focus on something, the more the eyes will converge and come together. So this type of ET can often be treated by using glasses and reducing the amount of strain placed on the eye when trying to focus. Um, acquired ET is another subtype, which can be caused by a, a, very, a variety of different things, including six nerve palsies, hydrocephalus, intracranial masses, so on and so forth. Um, so that's one of the categories where you really need a, a little bit more help to determine the etiology. Um, Pseudoesotropia is a, a very common finding. We've seen uh, several cases of this so far uh, over at Primary Children's, and it's, it's the appearance of esotropia where there is none, and you can determine this using the corneal light reflexes to figure out if the patient's eyes are actually straight or deviated. Um, it's caused by occipital folds and broad nasal bridges. Um, so here I've just got a couple of quick examples. On the left you can see um, what is a true esotropia, um, and on the right you can see the helpful arrows pointing out some epicanthal folds that make it appear as though there's less sclera on the patient's right eye over there, where there is actually an equal amount of sclera, it's just covered by so a lot of people will refer these patients in for evaluation when, in fact, their vision is normal. So some red flags to look out for when you're um, evaluating a patient with esotropia. Uh, age of onset is, is very important. I think most esotropias, I believe, present between six months and, I believe, about two years. Acute onset is also much more concerning. If a patient has no visual problems and then within a short span develops a constant esotropia, uh, that can be a red flag for some intracranial processes. Uh, also, low amounts of hyperopia, family history of neuro disorders, associated symptoms such as occipital headaches, things like that are, are red flags to watch out for. Optic atrophy, greater estropia at distance, and significant incompetence in side gaze is also a red flag. So here's a case presentation for you guys, and uh, the patient's name is not actually LM. It's just uh, a little shout out because I like soccer and I like Lionel Messi, so let's go with that. Um, the patient was a four-year-old Caucasian male who presented to clinic for a new onset eye crossing accompanied by weekly headaches worsening over the past seven months. He denies nausea, vomiting, auras, worsening pain with activity, photophobia, and pain with eye movement. Um, father reports some clumsiness when taking care of the ball compared to the patient's brother, so that's kind of a good control, and denies falls. Um, LM wears glasses most of the time. 
and his family history is unknown due to being adopted. All of their review systems is negative, and he has no known allergies, past medical history, or surgical history. So, I thought they'd use eye exam here. Visual acuity was 20-30 in both eyes with correction. Uh, his uh, prescription was plus 1.5 sphere OU. His pupils were unremarkable. He was a not a very uh, happy camper, so we couldn't really do tonometry on him. Um, his sun light external exam and sun exam were all normal. We did cooperate for those. Uh, strabismus exam showed 30 diopters of ET in all gazes without any BVG. So one of the medical students here, would you like to tell me what kind of uh, estropia that is if it's constant in all gazes? Everyone got that? It's a concomitant ET. So the next steps in diagnosis here, um, anybody want to try and hazard a guess at the differential diagnosis so far? Okay, I'll move on and give you some more information. So we did a, a little bit further workup with him because his dad did report clumsiness and we were concerned about some neurologic processes going on. So we went ahead and ordered an MRI of the brain, um, which is one of the more common neuroimaging studies for eye uh, manifestations as opposed to like CT head, which is better for viewing things like strokes, bleeds, and uh, fractures. So MRI is good for looking at the soft tissues. It shows you the um, eye muscles, the optic nerve, and areas of the, the optic tract and pathway. So detailed neuro exam came back a uh, little bit uh, less than helpful because the patient was not cooperative again, but Ellen was alert and oriented. He was able to move all extremities spontaneously and purposefully, had clear speech, and lacked you know, major neuro deficits. So uh, more or less neuro exam was normal as far as it could be conducted. So now, does anybody have any ideas on differential? Well, he's got a concomitant esotropia. Its um, onset began about seven months ago, so he was between three and four at that time. So it's a little bit later onset, and he's got some neural findings that are a little bit concerning. So I'm going to call this acquired concomitant esotropia. Uh, and here is the MRI of his brain. Here's an axi axial view, which I like because it shows some of the um, eye muscles up there, which you can see are not inflamed terribly from this view. Um, so that's probably not what's going on causing his esotropia. You can also see some of the gray matter pathways there. Here's another view where you can see a little bit better shot at the patient's cerebellum. Um, and as you can see, it appears to be crowding the frame and magnum here. So move on to more views. And these, the nice thing about this is these are actually the images from the patient that was seen in primary children, which I think is kind of neat. Um, so down here, you can also see an area where the cerebellum is kind of subluxed into the foramen, be it very minorly. Um, so now does anybody, sorry, that image is kind of dark, but you can still see a little bit of the cerebellum moving down into the foramen. So now does anybody have any ideas about what's going on? Probably everyone knows. Okay. Chiari, right, very good, excellent. So as you've all deduced, this talk is about Arnold Chiari mal malformations. Uh, subcategories are broken up into one through four, uh, where Chiari malformation type one includes usually a syringomyelia uh, component, and Chiari type two com um, contains a myelomeningocele component, whereas this patient's MRI was read as a nine millimeter deviation of the cerebellum into the frame magnum, which is a, a, on the smaller side, so he had less severe symptoms, and he also did not have any accompanying syringomyelia or myelomeningoceles. So the radiologist read this as a very mild, atypical presentation of Arnold Chiari malformation. Um, so this is kind of a rare presentation. It's a little bit different, which is why I wanted to bring it to you all for the grand rounds. It's um, another basic fact about Chiari that I find kind of interesting is that it causes a lot of downbeat nystagmus. So if you have a patient in the clinic and they've got primary downbeat nystagmus, you should think about this because it's, it's got a good chance of being the etiology. Um, so other symptoms of this, as I already mentioned, headaches, clumsiness, and ataxia, ocular manifestations. There's really tr two main schools of thought on treating Chiari malformations that affect the eye. So you can do this, you can, you can have successful resolution of problems with eye muscle surgery, or you can perform neurosurgical enlargement or deframen, or both, depending on how the, the patient's symptoms present. And I was, I was gonna ask uh, later on for a little bit of help from some of the more senior um, physicians here to speak if you have any wisdom on what you've tried in the past, if you've seen a lot of patients with this, and which seems to work better. But here are my sources, and I'll open it up for discussion and questions right now. Um, also, bonus points if anyone can name this mountain. And the view from here, 
courtesy of student Michael Gilbert and uh, Tim Lavin also joined us on this wonderful hike. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any discussion on uh, patients they've seen with previous GRA malformations and how they were treated?
It was nine, I believe the MRI report said. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, doctors. Anyone else have questions or comments? Yes. I just have one comment. Um, you guys mentioned the talk of eutopia, uh, eutopia or I don't know why I mentioned it. You can tell by the audience that Trump is in the audience and not all the observers in the room. But thank you. Um, and thank you also to the other students for being here today. They know that they need to be here. Thank you. figured it out. It's Mount Olympus. Thank you.